Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Addicted Mind Podcast. My name is Dwayne Osterland. I'm your host, and we are on to another episode. Today, my guest is Ronnie Marmo. Marmo is a 25-year veteran actor, director, producer, and writer who is formerly from Brooklyn, New York, Woodbridge, New Jersey, who has resided in Los Angeles for the past 25 years. Most recently, Marmo wrote and starred in I'm Not a Comedian, I'm Lenny Bruce, directed by Joe Montaigne. The play has run for over 438 performances between Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago, and has been on a national tour for the past three years. He is also known for his television work on CBS Criminal Minds, Fox Lethal Weapon, as well as a 150 episode arc as Detective Ronnie Demisco on General Hospital. So Ronnie Marmo directs and stars in Bill W. and Dr. Bob, a powerful, funny, and profoundly inspirational story detailing the events that led to the creation of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that play is coming to the Richard Christensen Theater of the Biograph Theater in Chicago with performances starting March 8th. So Marmo first joined Alcoholics Anonymous at the age of 17 and credits the organization with saving his life. So on this episode, I talk with Ronnie about his experience of directing these plays and acting in these plays and the meaning that has in his life and his own recovery. It was really nice to talk with Ronnie and just hear his humility around this topic and his really strong desire to make this story known, to provide hope and wisdom to others out there who experience the impact of addiction in their lives. So let's start this episode. Today, my guest is Ronnie Marmo, and we're going to talk about your new show, Ronnie, and what you've all put together for the community of recovery. And so let's just jump in. Tell us a little bit about you and this production. Let's go. So my name is Ronnie Marmo, as you said, and I am, uh, I've been a 12 stepper for a very long time. I've been very blessed. Um, this show came, this script came to me about 25 years ago. And uh, obviously, I was always fascinated because I got very, very lucky. I, I found recovery as a teenager. Thank goodness. Yep. Uh, I ended up picking up again, and then I found it again at 20 years old. And I've been, uh, thank God, I've been haven't had a drink or a drug since. But uh, the play was very attractive to me because Bill and Bob. I mean, these these two guys. I mean, they saved countless lives. Yeah. And. You know, I direct the show, and I'm also playing Bill Wilson, which is really amazing to 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 get to do that. And uh, and that's really it. You know, I, I I'm very proud of it. We've we ran it five times in L.A. over 20 years. It's it's become a bit of a um, you know, I went from like, should I produce this play because it's about the guys from from the program, and it went from like, I you know, with the traditions, you got to be careful. And I'm like, I don't. And then once I saw the outpouring of love and and people writing letters saying, I could finally stay sober now. I couldn't before. It's so simple. It's like a pop-up book for the big book, and I needed this. And 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 so once I saw that, I said, wow, this is this is actually my responsibility at this point. I need to put this show on for, for everyone. So we're going to Chicago, and then we're going to take it on the road. That is awesome. So let's talk a little bit about Bill W. and Dr. Bob. For people out there who might be listening and don't even know this story... Can you give us some insight into that? And, you know, a lot of people who are listening may know the story, but I think it's a powerful story. And so yeah. let's give them some introductions so they know. Absolutely. Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith were two gentlemen in uh, 1935, came together. They had a chance meeting. Uh, Bill Wilson was five months sober, obviously without AA, it didn't exist. Uh, he was uh, five months sober on his own. He was, in, he was from New York. He was a stockbroker from New York. He ended up in Akron, Ohio on a business deal. The whole thing blew up and the deal went south and he was stuck there in Akron and he was uh, standing in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel and he, he the bar was like, the music was loud and looked very attractive and he was gonna go in there and have a drink and he looked over and saw this church directory with 10 numbers and names. And he went over there and something told him he needed another drunk to talk to. He just kind of heard it. And so he called all 10 they were hanging up on him. You were a dream. He's like, I'm Bill. I'm a drunk. And they're hanging up, you know. Right. And then the 10th the person was Reverend Tunks, who introduced him to uh, to Henrietta Cyberling. Henrietta said, I know a guy. And it was Dr. Bob Smith. Come tomorrow. You'll, uh, you'll meet him. 
And so they got together in this chance meeting and Bob was in terrible shape. And um, Bob basically said, I'll give you 15 minutes. And they talked for six hours and the rest is his. They literally stayed in the room for six hours and it was, wow. it was mad. Yeah, the whole thing. So these two guys in 1935 came together and, and changed the world, really, you know. And did it, yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you took this play and started to put it together and and the meaning between your own life and and doing this work. You know, it's like, it's like, like I mentioned, I mean, I've been very blessed. I didn't squander a lot of precious time. I, you know, I, I, as a teenager, I, I was running wild and alcohol and other pharmaceuticals were a part of my story, to say the least. Uh, and so I hit my knees pretty early. And so I had been in and out of rehab since I was an early teen. I finally got this thing at age 20. At age 17, I had it for, I was two years and 10 months sober. And then I, and then at 20, I was like, oh, there's no way I'm an alcoholic. Give me a break. You know, I'm a 20 year old right, kid. Right. And I picked up a drink and that night I was back to my craziness. And so nine months later, I finally came back into the rooms. Thank God. And, uh, and so, you know, when I approached the material, it was, you know, it's like you start with yourself, you start with the truth and you see where that takes you. There's certain characteristics, uh, you know, when you're playing a Bill Wilson or directing a show, you have to kind of get in tune with, with the behavior and the characteristics of those, those characters. But at the end of the day, you have to find that within you uh, in order for the audience to, to have an experience and not just watch an actor work. It's uh, more than that, you know. Yeah, because these these guys, you know, this story is so powerful. These guys were desperate. I mean, back in the 30s, there was no treatment. It, it you know, it was just a moral failing. And I'm wondering about connecting to that time to connect to these characters to bring them to life because it, it was a different time than it is now. And yeah. I'm, I, I was just wondering about that because it, it's a powerful story. These guys took a huge risk. I don't think people realize today, like what that risk was, what they really started in, in those moments at that time. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, what you said, it was a moral failing. I mean, you know, alcoholics were just like, you know, tied down to beds and hospitals and thrown away and put in insane asylums and this is what you did to drunks. You didn't know what to do with them. You locked them up in rubber rooms, you know? And these guys took a risk and they were, and they were the two perfect guys to do it because Bill Wilson was this hot shot st stockbroker from New York. And Dr. Bob Smith was a very, you know, Midwestern, uh, just a very easy does it kind of guy. He was a doctor uh, in Akron, Ohio. And the two of them came together and were basically the yin to, their, to the other one's yang. And they, they really, they really helped each other a lot as they tried to develop this program. Bill wanted to save the world and Bob wanted to just find one more alcoholic to work with. And so it was a funny balance and they, and they needed each other, you know? Yeah. And so uh, it was a time when nobody else was taking these, you know, no one else, you know, when Bill heard that voice, I need another drunk to talk to. It was wild. It kind of changed the whole game. Thank God. I, I always thought that was kind of like divinely inspired, you know? Yeah, I think the the universe came together to bring these people to this place where they met. And what's interesting is I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about how, you know, they came together to form a community. And I'm wondering how, as you do this play and as you present this to the audience and you bring it to them, how that creates community as well. And the, I guess acting in it, but I, I don't know if you're actually watching the audience, but as you're acting, but you know, the experience of being there in, in a space where there's all these people who are probably struggling with addiction as well. And they're hearing the story and they're watching you. And I guess the interaction of that and you and that, and what's that like for you? You know, it's, it's wild. I mean, you know, listen, I've been very blessed in my career to be able to, you know, make a living in this uh, film and TV but there's nothing like the theater, especially with material like this, that relationship between you and the audience is, although you're doing the same script every night, it's unique to tonight. Tonight is the night we have, you know, it's right here, right now. It's so immediate and the, and the reaction is immediate. You know, you, you do a movie a year later, you see how an audience feels about something, but it's right now. So what's it like? It's like, you know, I, ha I have to treat it with 
you know, and approach it with complete humility because once I start thinking I'm good at this, I, got, I probably have a problem on my hands. It, I don't think mm -hmm. the, the, the performance for this or the Lenny Bruce show I'm doing, the one-man show, I don't think yeah. either either one of those would have the same genuine uh, uh, appeal if I, you know, if I, if I started thinking I was really good at this. So it's, it's just a very humbling experience. Uh, and yeah. uh, when I'm able to get out of the way and just be a vessel for these two very important men, uh, then I think we got something, you know? And so it's, uh, I have to pinch myself. It's wild I get to do this, you know? What's it like combining your own recovery journey? Because if, you know, my thought is if you're doing 12-step work, you're digging in deep to yourself. You're, you have to dig in farther to understand yourself. I mean, that's part of the 12-step work, taking your moral inventory and going through the, the steps. And I'm wondering how doing this show and doing your own work and how they interla interlap with each other. Well, you know, it's interesting because I teach an acting class every week on Zoom. And, uh, and we, the, one of the things we focus on is what you're talking about. It's like, how do you find whatever role you're playing? How do you find yourself in that character? Like it's got to, I like to work from inside out as an actor. And it's like, where does that live within me? How can I identify with this character? And, you know, have I felt shame? Have I felt disappointment? Have I felt ha true happiness? Have I felt all those things? The answer is yes. So I have to find those things within me in order to, uh, to give the audience a very genuine audience i mean i believe the actor it's his responsibility to to completely give himself over to material and that's even silly whatever it is it could be some sitcom where i'm doing five lines and we're having just having some laughs and playing you know whatever a cab driver whatever and so you have to find that within you in order for it to be authentic so you know that it's it's wild to do that and and the more i'm willing to do it the more rewarded i am and my heart and my mind, uh, I'd like to believe my heart doesn't know I'm acting. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like I always tell the story with Lenny Bruce. I've been on tour. I've been doing Lenny for six years now. And six years ago, Lenny and I didn't agree on everything. But six years later, I couldn't tell you what those things are anymore. You know, my heart doesn't know I'm fighting for Lenny on stage. So I don't, right. I don't know where we disagree anymore. You know what I mean? So it kind of comes together. It's almost like you become these characters. What do you think you learned about them as people as you've done this work? And how have you, I know that might sound weird because you're kind of enter, entering their world and what they went through. And I'm just wondering how those kind of come together to, to what are your insights, I guess, as you've done this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting because like I any character like this, specifically these two guys is... Uh, you know, I try to start with their 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 humanness. Uh, mm -hmm. I try to find them as human beings. And and what I really realize about Lenny and Bill, who who many people have many opinions about, is that no one is just one thing. Yeah, I'm not one thing. You're not one thing. No one is. You can't encapsulate me in a word or a sentence. Yeah. And so that's how I feel about these guys. It's like you know, people go, "Oh, Lenny Bruce, that foul mouth." I go, "Wait a minute." What do you know about Lenny Bruce? Did you hear that from a friend? You heard that from a friend? Right. You want to come and meet Lenny? Why don't you come and meet Lenny? So, so the, you know, it's really an interesting, it's really an interesting journey to make them human. And whether you agree or disagree with Bill or Lenny or or anything, I just, you know, that's that that's the problem with our society now. And social media has given a lot of people permission to call themselves writers. Right. It used to mean something to be a journalist. And so, uh, People think now you can say and behave any way you want or, or, or encapsulate someone within a word or a sentence or a silly post. And pe we're human beings, you know, we're having an experience. And so I try to stay out of debates with people about, about the characters I'm playing because you can't, you know, people have their thoughts. But it's, you know, I, I just hope that you make three and people three and four dimensional, you know, um, in my career, I've played a lot of gangsters. You know, with this face, I played a lot of gangsters. And so, mm -hmm. so people go, oh, yeah, you don't, yeah, you don't. I don't play them that way. You know, I try to find, make them three and four dimensional because they're actually people with families and this and that, and they happen to do this for a living. So 
I think it's my job to make them as complex and interesting as possible. What about the contrast between these characters? You've got Bill W. and Dr. Bob who went into recovery and you got Lenny who struggled with addiction for his life. And, and it's such a contrast. And I'm just yeah. wondering how that comes out and, and bringing those two pieces together. I mean, these two shows that are, I guess, in some ways, uh, different, the same and different. You know, it's interesting is like both of those people live in me. And so I, I know what it feels like to be uh, desperate and to live in complete despair and powerlessness. And I also know what it's like to to create amazing things and to be in a position of uh, helping others. And uh, and and so I, I've 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 had high highs and low lows in my life, like like all of us. And so what's it like? It's like being willing to expose those on a nightly basis. Um, they're very similar in a sense because they both were visionaries and very intelligent people. Uh, Lenny never found recovery, sadly. Uh, yeah. Uh, but Bill did, I mean, obviously. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's a wild journey. Um, it just goes back to trying to figure out where they live within you and having the courage to expose yourself. I mean, there's nothing worse than watching acting, right? You see some acting, you go, I don't want to watch that. But when, you, but when you're moved by a performance and you go, oh my God, you know, I, here's the bottom line. I always feel that an audience doesn't come to the theater to see me. Right. They come to the theater to see themselves in me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so that's what I really feel. You know, that that's that's always my approach. It's like, they're not coming to see me. They're coming to identify on some level and see themselves through my performance. So what is it like when, when you do this show at conventions and, and you've done some of these at like AA conventions and, and things like that in the community? What's it like to to see the reaction of, of people watching watching these shows and, and seeing them? It's it's uh, uh, it's the greatest feeling in the world, you know. It's the greatest feeling in the world. It's wild to to have that experience. Um, they listen. Th this is a nice. Th th this is a great theater piece. People just if you love theater, uh, you'll dig the show. But obviously, the people who you know it attracts a bit more than everyone else are the twelve steppers. Uh, you also see the birth of Al-Anon in this show, which is pretty magical in the moment. Oh, that's cool. So, um, yeah, it, it's really cool. And so what you get a lot is a lot of head nodding in the audience, a lot of elbowing. You hear a lot of, there's the mom, look at them talking to each other. And I'm like, shh, I'm acting. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm trying to, shh. it's very funny. It's like, and you know, what's great is like some of the people who see the show, this might be their first theater experience. Oh, wow. So, so as an artistic director of a theater company, like you have no idea how much that turns me on. It's like, oh my God, I'm giving you this really important play that really might stick with you hopefully forever, but I'm also introducing you to the theater, which is my first love. And so it's a wild experience, man. I, I do not take this lightly and um, it's super cool. And see, and, and this is the only play that I've ever done that I tell the actors, when you take your bow, don't go change. Go right out to the lobby. Oh. Don't change your clothes. I don't care if you look like a banana and it's 1935. Go to the lobby and meet these people. You have no idea what you're doing for them. And then this relationship happens between them and it's just magical. And it's like, and so it's like addicting in a sense because you run out there and you just want to meet people and there's hugging and there's crying and there's laughing and there's gratitude and and uh, and I and and so that's a requirement. If I, I tell the actors go out there and meet the people, you know, it's it's really wild. Well, that's like you know you're doing this piece that speaks to the the deep pain of of addiction, the the hardship of addiction, and I would imagine the the what you're doing it continues, right? It doesn't just continue. It's off the stage. It continues after the stage because you're connecting, you're building these relationships with people who may may have just been exposed to this or exposed to this in a way that um, moves them because it's a deep story. There's no doubt. I mean, it's it, to, to be in this position 
that we get to uh, present something that means so much to them. You know, I've heard people say like, it's the greatest meeting I've ever been to. It's with Bill and Bob, you know, they kind of yeah. see it that way. And as a 12 stepper, I've been around the rooms after the show and they're like, Oh my God. I'm like, I'm not really Bill Wilson. I'm just pretending that's, that's I'm not really right. You know, but once somebody sees you, it's kind of equivalent to like, there was a great movie when I was in rehab, when I was a teenager, my name is Bill W came out, which was with mm -hmm. James Woods, James Garner, uh -huh. played Bill and yeah. Bob, Joe Beth Williams played Lois. And when I see uh, James Woods in anything, I go, there's Bill Wilson. You know, like I can't unsee it. You, you can't, know? you can't unsee it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get that. You know, it's like, I'm not exempt from that as, a, as an audience member and as a fan of, you know, film and theater and all that. I see James Woods. I like, I have this little, like, it doesn't matter what he does. I'm rooting for him because he was Bill Wilson, you know? Yeah. Totally. Who who do you think this show resonates with the most? And what are the people that really just love to be there and really relate to it? Well, the, the, the you know, the simple answer is the 12 steppers. I mean, it's just, it's another level. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's been interesting. And again, I don't want to scare theater folks off because half our audience is theater, are theater folks, but the other half are, are 12 steppers. And uh, I'll never forget one time we we're backstage in LA and all of a sudden somebody in the audience, I don't know what happened, but suddenly the serenity prayer broke out and the entire audience was doing a serenity prayer. No way. And the cast backstage goes, what the hell's going on out there? I go, they're doing a serenity prayer. Let's go. So that's what I mean. Like it's, it's the only show I told the actors, it's the only show you'll ever do that they're rooting for you and they love you before you bought the ticket. Yeah. Before they bought the ticket, they love you. That doesn't mean you don't have to earn their respect and, and dig deep in your performance. It right. means like, and that's Chicago audiences anyway. I mean, they're so damn uh, supportive. It's wild over there. I mean, it's I love that city. And so so it's already like that. But this place, but specifically, they're like, let's go. Let's go to the theater. And people come back a dozen times. Yeah. I hear people know it's my 10th, my 5th. This is my 12th. This is what you hear in the audience. Well, it takes the, you know, if 12 Step has saved their life and been the community that they've gotten recovery in, I mean, this story is so much a, a part of it. And it, it's a story of hope and a story of possibility and a story of change and potential. And and so one, one more question I, I have for you. I'm here, no worries. Directing it and taking that response, producing and directing it, how do you approach that to, to make it this piece that has that power to move people in that way? You know, as, as, a, as a director, because I direct a lot of stuff, as a director, if I'm starring in something, generally speaking, I don't like to direct it. And if I do direct it and star in it, I usually bring in somebody who I trust, like Joe Montaigne, my, my dear pal, mm -hmm. who directed the Lenny Bruce show. I'll bring in Joe and say, Joe, can you come watch a rehearsal today? Give me some notes, like watch my performance. So I'll do that. I'm not above that. I don't think I, but it's hard. It's hard to wear all these hats. There comes a time when I have to stop uh, and I have to make sure I'm, I'm giving enough of my time and energy to the art and to the performance, because ultimately that's what people are going to see. So that I have to be, uh, uh, between myself and my wife, we have to make sure that we uh, allow that time and monitor that time and go, okay, now it's time to work on the play. But at the end of the day, it's, it's all love. It's, it's all, it's my instincts. Um, you know, look, I don't, I don't take it. I don't treat this process as like a right or wrong experience. Like this is how you direct the play. I just treat it as like how I see it and the energy that I feel about it. And, and the hope is that people identify and it seems like they do. And so, like I said, on and off the stage, I try to treat it with as much love and humility as I can muster up. And then good things happen because of that. You know, once, once I think I have this down pat, I should probably stop doing it, you know? There you go. Okay. So we're, we're coming up on our time here. I love to ask my guests like w one more question and maybe someone out there is listening maybe somebody's struggling and they don't know what to do next or or they're in addiction's grip and what would you want to say to them if you could tell them one thing what would you want them to know well you know that's a big question one thing i mean we could i, I know i know it's a big question that's a tough one uh you know today uh could be the start of your new life you know at some point you, you know if you ask for help things happen uh i think i think often uh 
people feel like they're alone and they're isolated and they and they live and and you know when when you when you keep it in your mind and your heart all to yourself it feels so massive that you sometimes are crippled by it you can't move but if you share it with someone it cuts it in half if you just ask for help and you say hey man I'm struggling. You'll be shocked how many people feel exactly like you. And so, you know, my old sponsor used to say, you know, you could refund your misery at the door anytime you want, but why don't you give me another day? Just give me another day. And sometimes a day, sometimes it's an hour. It's been a minute at a time. Yeah. Uh, in recovery, you know, I have hit some spiritual bottoms. Uh, it's not always rosy. I mean, you know, the last five years has been my my best five years in, in recovery. I have worked this thing harder than I ever have before. And, uh, I'm very proud of that, and I. Um, but if you are if you are trying to figure out where to go, the first step just ask for help. We have such a short time here, you know. When I when I talk to people, I'm like, please, you don't have to squander any more precious time. You are not the sum of your past. You're not the sum of your mistakes. Today could be the first day. I mean, let's let's go. You know. Uh, Reach your hand out. You know, it's a it's a funny balance because, you know, when you're talking about sobriety, you don't want to promote yourself too much. But at the same time, Bill Wilson said, never be too anonymous where you can't help someone. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And in 2024, it's a different time than 1935. I think, you know, I think social media and everything, things have just changed. And so, you know, I try to make myself available if anybody needs help and uh, even strangers. I mean, I've gotten on lots of phone calls with people I don't know Yeah, trying to help because I realize just like the first day in 1935, just like that first day between Bill and Bob, it always comes back to one drunk talking to another. And, uh, and what you think is you think I'm helping you, but I'm actually helping myself by talking to you. That's how this works, you know. And so if, if you're trying to figure out what's happening, ask for help. I know it sounds, sometimes the phone is 800 pounds. I know that. But just ask for help, you know? Oh, th thank you, Ronnie, for, for saying that and, and, and doing the, the work that you're doing. And sometimes I think like your production and, and your shows open the door for a lot of people who maybe don't know that there's community out there that they can be a part of, that there's hope out there. And so I'm just thankful that you're doing this and you're and you're giving back in this way. How can people find out more information? Uh, they want to go to these shows. How do they get a hold of you? How do they find it? Where do they go? Well, uh, LennyBruceOnStage.com, BillWNDrBobOnStage.com. They're both on stage.com. Uh, you can find uh, either show, uh, you know, those are the websites. Please follow us on all the socials. Uh, I don't personally handle the social medias, but uh, but if there's any messages in there for me, I get them pretty quickly. I make sure they share them with me. So I am Lenny Bruce, uh, Bill W. and Dr. Bob on stage. Those are the social medias on all, all the stuff, all the things. And, you know, we're, we're, we're close by, you know. Uh, I, I hope to see some of these people. If you come to either show, Please stay for a moment afterwards. I always come right out. I make it a point to, to say hello to anybody who wants to connect. So uh, please please uh, hang out for a minute, I, and I will be right out. You know, Awesome. I will put all those links in the show notes, too, at theaddictedmind.com so people can get them there. Ronnie, I just want to thank you for, for coming on to The Addicted Mind, sharing your wisdom, sharing your story, and doing this work. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for having the podcast for people who need it. I mean, it's it's super cool to be able to. Uh, you're in a position where you could touch people too, and that's really really awesome. You know, we have to we have to uh, give of ourselves in order to, to live the life we want to live. You know, a absolutely, couldn't agree more. Thank you, Ronnie. You got it. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Addictive Mind podcast. As usual, all the show notes will be at theaddictedmind.com, so you can check it out there. And if you got a lot out of this episode, share it with a friend. I'd really appreciate that. And don't forget, you can follow us on Instagram, Addicted Mind Podcast. So find us there. And if you have any questions you want to ask me or topics you want covered or guests you think should be on the Addicted Mind, reach out to me. Let me know. You can find me at theaddictedmind.com. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful day. And I will talk to you on the next episode.